All right, welcome everybody to this episode of Breaking Absolutes. Um, first and foremost, uh, apologies for a few of the technical glitches. Um, those are all my fault, um, which is embarrassing since we're talking to an engineer today who's uh, obviously tech savvy and, and all kinds of things. We're going to talk to James Meslin. Um, James is known uh, affectionately as Jimmy T. Um, I think many of the, the followers of this channel will know him from his work with Dream Theater. That, of course, is not all that that James does. Um, he's been, he has been an important factor on um, many of their recent releases um, and been a fixture in, um, in the community in his area, both as a, a musician uh, as well as an engineer. This is consistent, this particular show is consistent with our idea of talking to people who are kind of working on the forefront uh, in the music, um, you know, in the music category uh, that are doing interesting things and pushing themselves, pushing their own envelope and creating music that we think deserves a broader audience. This is the first time, though, that we're talking to someone kind of uh, behind the scenes. We, we have talked to a, a producer, but in a different category of music. So this is exciting uh, for many reasons for me today. Um, so with that as my preamble, let me bring James on. Welcome, James. How are you? Good. Hey, is it weird for you to hear James since Jimmy T seems to be the way you refer to all the time? I mean, it's not weird. It's a little bit more like uh, it flips the switch as if I'm home. My okay. my family and, and things like that call me James. And then usually in the studio or on tour, just the industry, I'm I'm typically Jimmy. Okay. I'll use I'll use Jimmy if that's okay. Right. That's perfect. Okay. Um, so first of all, thanks for taking some time with us today. Um, the, our goal is always to to try and talk about the many dimensions of the uh, people who are working in and around music. Um, so the idea is not to just talk about one thing. Um, but before we get into the music conversation, I, I, especially recently, I like to get a pulse from people on how they're weathering this whole COVID thing. Has this interrupted what you do at all or has it just made it a different approach? Um, it's, it's just kind of forced me to uh, change gears a bit. I a, a bit of a backstory about myself. I came up more through the studio scene, more so than than live audio, which I eventually moved into, uh, namely through Dream Theater around 2016. But coming up and where I cut my teeth and and really what brought me into this industry was working in studios. Um, so on the heels of the the pandemic. I got a call from Petrucci to do his solo record. So that was like, we knew tour touring was canceled. Dream Theater had tours lined up uh, after February. That was our last show was February 24th, uh, 2020. So that was obviously shut down moving forward, going to Asia, continuing the, the scenes tour. Um, we had filmed in London, like the second to last show. Uh, and when we came back, it was, you know, two and a half weeks or so before I got a call from Petrucci and we decided we would just close our bubble, just me and him every day, five to six days a week. Uh, saw no one else except my wife at home and, and John in the studio. And that kind of continued on for, for the better part of the year was either getting something in remote. Uh, I mixed the dream theater DVD that was a couple months of my life there. We did LTE. I did the new uh, upcoming Dream Theater record and filled in odds and ends with some outside mixes. If I had a free day or a free evening, I'd do that. Uh, so it's really been busy, which is a blessing. You know, I I, I have a lot of, a lot of uh, I feel very, very bad for all my buddies in the live scene because it's been really tough for that world that world didn't have you know this this like silver lining of like there was a takeaway for me because i had so much time and experience in the studio a lot of those guys who were mixing shows every day and and backline crews and things like that with the with the live industry down you know there's there's nothing you can really do to supplement it even virtual concerts things like that there's nothing like a real venue so for me personally things stayed busy but, yeah. you know, I definitely feel for, for the people who didn't have that. Yeah, it's um, in the music industry and um, 
with so many of the conversations I've had here, um, there's been a little bit of a silver lining, whether it's a musician who finally gets to a project they hadn't planned to get to, um, or at the very least being able to, to record. So a lot of people have stayed busy, but those folks on the front lines with the live stuff have suffered a lot. Um, oh, massively. Yeah. And it's not always true. And you can probably speak to this because you actually do possess the skills, but it's not always true that someone who does live audio is necessarily a great studio engineer. Is that a fair statement? I uh, very much so. And, and vice versa, you know, I would, I'd even put myself on the line and say, if push comes to shove where, where my strengths are, I know that it resonates more in, in one scene than the other. There's, a lot of similar tech talk. There's a lot of similar, you know, things you'll use and approaches, but there's also totally different mindsets and a totally different set of skills you need to know to be that ace hire, you know, that ace person on the gig. Uh, what works for me very well in the live world is that I'm working with Dream Theater where the advantage I have with them is the, the technical skill set is only a portion of why we work so well together. We know each other on a very personal level, and that extends into our professional careers so that having me on stage and monitors for them, we can communicate really uh, direct and, and efficiently that they always have a consistent show. They feel comfortable and confident seeing me in the monitor position. And I know what I'm listening for, for each of those guys, because I know them each uniquely. I know them in the studio, what they like to hear, how they kind of tick when they write, what I, I can, I can remember back to what that person was explaining while they wrote that specific section and yeah. know why they want to hear it this way. And if, we're using a click track why this person might might want to hear it in seven versus nine and, you know the whole the whole dramas of working with the prog prog band i am uh my secret weapon with them is that we're we're very close on a personal level as well that i can translate that into the gig and make it make it pretty seamless for them yeah it, i mean it, it makes a ton of sense to me that you would um, do really well with them live since you're, you've been so intimately involved and in, I think is it the last three records? Yeah, uh, well, I've had, I'd had, I had had something to do with a record of uh, all the records since the self-titled, which was 2012. Okay. I assisted their self-titled and I assisted on The Astonishing. And then okay. off of that, I started touring with them. Was, um, now, is that at Cove City? It was. Those two records were done at Cove City in Glen Cove. And that's Richie Kanata, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I, the only reason I know that is because when we did the uh, the Astonishing novel, um, we were looking for people to write the forward and afterward. Yeah. And John right. came up with Richie for, for part of that cool. because of the recording experience. Yeah. Richie, uh, he's a big part of my life. Uh, when I was... I had gone to like a, a nine month trade school uh, shortly after I graduated high school and, and whatever. And it, it gave me, going to trade school gave me the opportunity to touch large format consoles and be talking audio every day with like-minded people. It's definitely the type of thing where you get out what you put into it. You want to be the first one there and the last one there. Uh, that's something I took to heart. And then Cove City, was my first real internship opportunity. I ended up working there for a few years, eventually was the chief engineer of the studio uh, and stayed there working on projects either I brought in or, or projects that came through the door, including Dream Theater, until 2016 when, uh, when I left to, to work sound with them live. Okay. So... Um... We'll go back in time for a minute, but so the at this point you're you're you would still uh, you know do a record at Cove City, but that would be you as a as a freelance hire by an act who wants to record there, or um, is that kind of thing? Well, the audio scene is funny. 
um, you know, whether you're producing or engineering or however you're getting involved in a record, it can come in a lot of different ways. You know, some when I was staff at Cove City, I still had like my own home studio. Uh, and that kind of allowed me to work a little bit more with passion projects, low budget stuff, music that I really related to, um, people closer to my age, things like that, where I was still, you know, in the early years, I was still kind of finding my myself in in the industry and and what sounds I identify with and guaranteeing people that I can make a real record with them, you know, so... I always, I always had this independent career outside of being a staff engineer, okay. but there was also these, you know, these layovers where it gave me an opportunity to bring artists I was working with independently into a, a real recording studio at whatever, you know, a, a deal that I was able to cut, you know, cause we would do drums there and then we'd take it away. And then I would also work with artists that just came through the door and I would get a call from Richie, the studio owner, and he'd say, Hey, be available for Thursday, 3 PM. We're doing, you know, a basic tracking drums, bass, guitar for a record you'll be doing for the next, you know, two months. Um, so my schedule always played in between who's booked me. What did I book it independently? Where am I doing it? Is it remote? And even today, you know, that, that mentality, at least for me, continues where I'm very well tied into something like the Dream Theater Camp. But if I have time and and the schedule has some open open dates, I'll book stuff. I'll I'll mix outside records. I'll pr produce, co-produce outside records, or or whatever facet someone wants to hire me in. I usually like to take on a lot of different things at once and and just fill in my weeks that way. Yeah. So it um it it would it be a fair statement that just because Dream Theater is such uh, a productive band between the the albums and the touring that that takes up the lion's share of your time? Yeah, I mean the best way to put it is I'm never not working on something Dream Theater related. There's always something in the background with those guys. Um, so whether it's you know taking up all my time or you know couple days a week or something or just being available to, to field a phone call and and things like that like right now we are more in a tour prep mentality so that could mean you know getting on a conference call to talk about what the audio package is looking like for the upcoming tour and making a writer and and figuring out uh you know what microphones we're going to bring is anything changing from the last time or it could be working with one of the guys uh on one of the one of the tunes they're gonna do because they they're not sure what they did uh you know in this moment of a song that they it's an older song i'll boot up hard drives i'll find stems i'll send them out someone needs a practice file to to you know learn their parts against i'll be making alternate mixes and that's just like the tour side of things that's just the prep side of things uh and that can coincide with the label all of a sudden needs you know certain stems because they're going to release something you know some oddball trailer um so those phone calls will come in and and because of my relationship with the band they they do take a, a large precedent the dthq which is a studio they they own i uh built and designed with maddie schifferstein who's john's guitar tech and is is kind of like a, a 360 turnkey type of guy for the band um we put this place together we've you know put together the control room the live room that they've cut the new record in john cut his solo record in lte but it's kind of like my home base that the studio rig is a frankenstein rig of stuff they own and stuff i own and i'm on it every day so there's a copacetic relationship there that i'm here i'm around their stuff they need something done their priority but when i do have time to mix another record um work with a you know a lot of close buddies in the industry who might be might have a project and they need a mixer i'll take those things on it, it i notice that i do get bored quickly with things i like to move between projects i like to move between setups um 
so it keeps everything fresh for me on the on the daily yeah are you uh, once you get into actual touring does that uh, does that limit you or do you like have a, it, a travel rig that you do mixing with i have i have a travel rig but it definitely impedes the the, the studio mindset and i kind of put it in put it in the back pocket a little bit like if there's some lingering projects i'll take a backup drive hopefully things are in place you know or like if there's an edit gig or something that comes up but when you are on tour um and just living away from home i've made the mistake in the past where I, maybe i took on too much while on tour and just sometimes you really need an off day to call home and and lay low um so if it's if it's very pressing you know i'll i'll manage something or on an off day i'll book a local studio and go in there with a the hard drive and do something but typically on tour i try and slow the pace a bit and just focus on the job at hand because i want you know you you, you don't want to burn yourself out and then not do your gig so yeah yeah that's right let's um let's go back we'll come back to to, to dream theater uh of course but let's go back so i was i was kind of like a uh magpie i was collecting bits of information that i could about your your story and you're you're also a musician you've been in bands yeah. um uh, I, is that still is that still something i mean it sounds like you're a very busy person is that still something that you do creatively is to write your own music yeah i mean i don't it's been wow it's been probably 11 or 12 years since i maybe like wrote a song on my own you know like i don't really have like an independent singer songwriter uh pursuit that i'm chasing but i got into audio because i was in bands and we needed to record bad demos you know and then that turned into the other bands in you know growing up also needed bad demos so it just started funneling in that I was available for that type of thing. And I started to, maybe not at the time, I didn't consciously realize it, but it started to turn studio production really into my main instrument. I, I've realized that production is probably my strongest musical asset and how I will run a session and operate a session and guide it um, from both a production standpoint, a mix standpoint, a tracking standpoint, if I'm in the room actually writing a song, I realized that, you know, seeing production as as a musical instrument that kind of grew with me. I didn't realize it in the beginning how much it would be a part of my life. Um, but, you know, if I'm, if I'm actually writing a song in the room, a lot of my input will not only come from, you know, what chord or, or scale or harmony should be happening, but, oh, do this you know, do this groove with no cymbals because we'll go full room mics there. And then maybe we'll drop out and it's just guitar on hard left. And then we all come in and building those impacts and effectiveness into the arrangement because in my head, I'm seeing the session. Um, I play, if I were to sit in, you know, in, in, in an act, I was in a, I was in a band called Time King for a long time. It's still kind of, it still exists, but it's slowed down a lot. Um, with the pandemic and things like that. And it's like a prog rock band. It kind of plays a little bit off of Mars Volta meets something like a snarky puppy with like more of like a fusion element and pop-esque kind of melodies. It's, you know, it's a congl uh, conglomerate of a lot of sounds, but you know, it's our sound. Uh, and that's, I played bass in that band, but production was always at the forefront of how I uh, gave my input and that continues with whatever project I'm working on. So even though I'm not really pursuing, we're not really pursuing Time King heavily at the moment, or I don't have any other personal music endeavors, any project I'm a part of, I'm voicing that input unless I'm specifically told to keep quiet, but typically that's not my personality in yeah. the studio or or even you know in in a live setting you know uh i'll voice those ideas i have and and creatively what could happen yeah i i would suspect that if you know that if that's your personality and that's what you're doing if a band's keeping you around it's because they're finding value in that input sure and i mean it's it's there's a line you know or like there's a a natural ebb and flow of maybe when you feel like it's time to say something and times 
that you're not. And if you don't have that intuition to read the room and read those moments, you might be asked to leave sooner than later, yeah. you know, and, and that's part of being in this position as well is understanding the psychology of it all. And, and it's great to develop a relationship with any artist that you're allowed creative input, but at the end of the day, they're the artist, it's their song, it's, you know, it's their legacy that they're going to live with. And sometimes you kind of just have to let them work things out on their own. Yeah. Yeah. So it sounds like, I don't want to, I don't want to um, overgeneralize, but it sounds like even some of your own uh, proclivity musically tends towards the progressive. Uh, I've done it for a long time. I've, you know, I've been in that world a long, world a long time, you know, like guitar driven music has been something I grew up with. That's what really drew me in. But I do have a lot of ties with more of a, a pop scene and a, a top 40 scene. And I have close friends who work every day in that world. And I do get to collaborate with them. And it's equally as fun. I get the same takeaway um, or the same sense of accomplishment and the same sense of excitement to be involved in those things. And, you know, there's something great about nailing the perfect guitar tone. And there's something really fun about taking a guitar DI and pitching it down an octave and putting a flanger and some wild effects on it and making it sound like a synth, you know, like they're two totally different routes to go. But ultimately, if you're finding something unique or something that inspires you, whatever genre it is, each genre might have a little bit of like a, a recipe to get where you're going. Uh, but I love them all the same, personally. Do you find that you um, it's helpful to you to move between them almost like a palate cleanser? And the, my context for this question is, is I... I I got the chance to talk to Devin Townsend the other day and he, and I, I, I guess this is probably subjective for all uh, musicians uh, and folks that are working to help musicians, you know, record and, and share their work, but he gets to the point where he, he gets weary of the thing he's working on. So he's really eager to do something very different um, just, you know, to keep himself stimulated. Is it, is there any truth to that on the other side of the console? Yeah, I, I'd say so. I mean, like, like anything, you could get burnt on it. I mean, working on guitar music all day, even just in a 12 hour day, all of a sudden you're, you're fried because typically things in, in that genre, everything's trying to be loud, you know, and, and you're trying to make space for stuff and everything is important needs to be heard and it's syncopation and this and that. And you're dealing with a lot of like 4k mid range, just blowing through the speakers and it's you know like it's exciting that's for sure but you yeah. can get fried just in one day now i'm from what i take from your question you're you're not necessarily meaning ear fatigue but more so mentally getting fried on a sound or a genre i i think it's valid to say it's nice to have a, a palate cleanser but it's also worth pushing yourself to really spend some time in certain in certain genres or certain scenes to really get to know it intimately and and give yourself an opportunity to trial and error and and, and try and beat your last production in the same you know that's in the same vein or down the same path if i only worked on rock music once every three months i don't know if i'd have the same edge that i feel i have now because i'm dialing in guitar sounds every day or or working with you know live drums every every day every week that gives you a uh, that gives you a means of not feeling like you have to start over every time you revisit it you know you can really solidify your own experience and your knowledge to go i like this and i know i like this because i did it on my last three records and it worked and i tried yeah. other stuff and i didn't like it and vice versa you know like on the other side like i enjoy getting to work on a pop record every you know once every month once every few weeks or even just you know listening to records outside of what you work on and really trying to digest what they're doing you're never going to run into dealing with sub bass and sub synth in metal music the way you're going to deal with it in 
a, on a pop record, you know, a, the sub synth could carry the whole song. It's not just a novel novelty mo moment where a Taurus pedal kicks in or there's a sub drop, you know? So yeah. allowing yourself to get the palate cleanse, but also not just driving by or, or, or zooming by every opportunity in each respective genre is worth, worth considering as well. Yeah. It makes a lot of sense to me. Um, I think, I think where Devin was coming from is he'll spend, it's his music and he's spending months and months to write it and then record it. Um, and then his fatigue is as a, he just mm -hmm. needs to write something different. Um, and There's I know totally a rabbit hole and you yeah. get, you get sucked down it. I mean, I experienced that, which is mixes, you know, like sometimes I'm just too in it, you know, sometimes the best thing you could do is just walk away for a day, you know, and like completely turn off. You could get obsessive about stuff in, in the creative industry because everything's subjective. And yeah. It's like the classic thing. You, you wake up in the morning and you start your day off and you think you're the best ever. And by the time, you know, by the time it's midnight, you realize you're the worst ever and you're still working on your snare sound that you thought you nailed. Yeah. I've had, uh, tell me if, if, if you've had this, um, I, I, not that I've done nearly as many records as you have, but I've been in the studio helping to kind of produce uh, a record that I had written or was working on. And after hours and hours, we think we just had gotten so beautifully masterful at capturing the sound. And with fresh ears in the morning, we just, it sounded like garbage. Um, uh, we just like we had spent so much time in it. I think we had started to to do either too much or overemphasize things. And we had songs that come out that um, where one instrument was um, was barely audible because we had just gotten so fatigued on the on the recording. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that that absolutely happens with not just the recording or the mix, but it could happen with you know writing a part. You know, you just sometimes you get when you get too far past maybe your your initial instinct sometimes you could get into some some sticky situations where once you come back you're like why did we do this yeah 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 that's uh it's 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 um encouraging to hear that others have that same experience <laughs> yeah you know what i would say that it's impossible not to experience it but when you've dealt with it enough you can see the writing on the walls a bit early and go okay i know where yeah. this i know where this ends up so maybe let's call it for an hour let's take you know let's take a break let's do a reset or if you time is not of the essence i'll see you guys tomorrow you know that's it's it's good practice to be able to read when you're going down the wrong path yeah so i um this is gonna probably sound like a, a tired question but i remember the first couple of albums that when I was on the artist side, um, the, the most valuable thing that worked for me to help me really start to hear whether or not we were capturing something was we'd, we'd I'd take it out into my car stereo and I'd listen to it really, really low. Mm -hmm. I'd, I'd listen to it really soft. Are there, and, and I'm not saying that that's the right way or the only way, but do you have, do you have um, techniques that you use to listen back in order to see if you're, if you're achieving what you're meant, what you're trying to achieve? Sure. I mean, part of, part of what works for me really well is, is just knowing my room, you know, knowing my room and knowing my, my system, um, jumping into a control room that you're not familiar with or a listening environment that you're not familiar with, with speaker sets you're not familiar with can be a huge, huge battle. And then you think you get it, you take it out to the car and it's the iconic car check and you're like, wow, this is the muddiest sound ever. It's terrible, whereas you're too much top end. So whether it's, you know, a $12,000 pair of speakers or AirPods or whatever cheapy computer speakers, knowing that set, knowing what you're listening to, you know, listening to other records that you like the sound of on, the, on that system gives you an advantage to, actually gauge what you're doing um when you're working on working on a system you know if you walk into a room that you've never worked in before it's worth putting on content that you know well whether that's a record you've done or someone else has done but something that you can gauge the sense of like 
wow, normally this feels like the low end is perfect, but right now it feels a little thin. Maybe that's because these speakers are thin or this room is thin or this sitting position is, you know, it has a loss of base or low end. Um, so that's the first tactic is make sure you know what you're up against before you're gauging how you feel. Um, I have the luxury at the moment to be consistently working in the same control room, uh, which a, a lot of people do. You know, a mastering engineer has their room. A, a mixing engineer has their room. As an engineer, you have to be adaptable and, and you should be able to go into any situation and make it happen. But you're always going to have the edge when you're working with your your tool set. Uh, so that's that's my biggest, you know, it's no secret. And so a lot of stuff in this industry, I feel like the most obvious answer is the answer. So in that situation, I would say, I know, I know this control room better than I know my car. I know my car very well, but I spend, you know, 12 to 15 hours a day on these speakers. And I've not only done that, but then I've taken it out to my car and gone, gone, oh man, that's not working or that's not how I thought it was going to be. And I've kind of calibrated myself to know, like to, to calculate the, the indifference between them to ultimately find that middle ground of maybe this room gives me a little bit more or these speakers give me a little bit more mid range than I actually need to cut because when I'm out in the car, it's not quite as harsh. And that made me listen on a different set. And so you kind of calibrate and, and figure figure out what you're listening for and, and what works and what doesn't in your room and how it will translate outside of it. Um, listening at low volumes is a great option, uh, but also listening at loud, loud volumes. Like the whole, the whole point of it is to try and gain perspective of how everyone will listen to it, which is yeah. low, loud, in between small speakers, big speakers, from the other room you know a lot of times when i'm running a, a final mix pass or something i'll step out of the room i've already heard the song you know 100 times plus top to bottom i'll step out and i'll, I'll make a coffee with the door open and just kind of see if anything's hitting me a little bit differently now with you know 20 feet in between me and the speakers uh so always being willing to gauge new perspective is is the trade secret and and understanding the systems you work on yeah so in the in the manufacture of dthq did you did you think about dimensions and angles and all the stuff or did you build it and then but, but now that you've been in it so 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 long you know the room or some some combination well, of both i'm not you know i would never i would never put on my business card that i'm an acoustician you know like i'm not i'm not going in and and building rooms from the studs up type of type of vibe. I understand conceptually a lot of ways that, you know, uh, approaches you would take and techniques you need to consider. Um, but we, or Dream Theater took over uh, this warehouse and there was, there were rooms in place on, on like the office side of things. And we just made decisions about what made the most sense to lay out a studio in where there's a control room, a live room, uh, you know, some lounge areas, a tech room, things like that. And working within those boundaries, we designed the rooms within it. So in the control room, we knew we, you know, I knew we wanted to load it up with uh, base traps and, and diffusion and absorbers in some way to kind of kill any potential for standing waves, uh, kill any potential for uh, base buildups and try and make the room as dead and flat as possible. Uh, there's some tools out there like the arc system and things like that, where you can get a frequency response of your room and, and try and account for it. Um, and we went through those motions or I went through those motions and the control room is pretty, pretty dry. It, it works really well. Um, and a very similar thing with our live room. The live room isn't very large. So in those instances, it's better to go dead with the room tuning and not try and make it something it's not. I'd rather get a sound that doesn't give me a bunch of reflections of sheetrock and mid-range build up and just kill it and make it as, as dry as possible and then add in uh, things as needed, you know, on, on, on the other end of things or 
find some tricks of where to put microphones and, you know, over compress them to make the room feel bigger than it is. But again, when you're working in a tighter space, you know, as in it's not a 30 by 30 with 40 foot ceilings, you know, you're going to, you're going to run into those situations where the room just doesn't sound pleasing if you let it do its thing on its own. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, I don't know. I, I I'm not, leaning in on that question because i pretend to understand it but i've been in i've been in some control rooms where there's been some really interesting um ways that they've they've tried to cr create the the deadening of the sound uh to create it really dry so it was in it i was just i was wondering how much of that was uh um, forethought and uh, i guess i was also wondering if it was something you guys built from scratch or if you inhabited a space and then customized it it sounds like it's yeah so that's yeah exactly that and for the first bit I worked in this room, the band had owned a set of speakers um, that were their main monitors. Uh, they kind of bought them, I guess, from a, a recommendation. Uh, and just no matter what I did, they, no matter what room, no matter what listening scenario, they just never made me feel confident. Um, and I felt like they sounded good in this room. Like they sounded better in this room than I'd heard them in previous situations. But I kind of got on a mission like right before right before the new Dream Theater record. So September-ish. Uh, yeah, so like a year ago. Wow. Uh, I got on a mission of I'm I'm looking for new speakers. I'm looking for new mains, you know, like our our big set in this room. And I ended up getting a loaner pair of quasars from this company, Ex Machina. I'll turn it. Well, you can see it right there, that big guy right there. Oh yeah yeah i sat these in this room and everything clicked for me everything just was like yes you know there's no learning curve on this for me i get it right away uh could be the way i don't know if you put each speaker up to one another if one's better than the other could be the way these speakers work in this room you know there's there are factors like that how how a speaker is interacting with the room um but that was a big moment for me where i was like wow this room doesn't just sound pretty good this room is officially rocking you know and and that was not just based off of the diffusers and absorbers we put in the room that was also based on a change out of equipment yeah so whether whether Dream Theater or another artist um, is, and, and maybe this changes by by artist, but are you, as you become familiar with the sort of sound or the signature of the band, do you, does that get dialed in so that you can carry it forward? Or do you find the artists are usually, you know, approaching each album, maybe looking to create some variance in the sort of the, the sonic experience? Uh, I'd say... I'd say, personally, me, I go for something different um, or just to, not to change the sound of the artist or the band, but to maybe explore, explore spaces that they haven't been presented before, but still works with them or they, they still identify with. Um, and broadly speaking, you know, like that, that could mean going for a roomier drum sound with a band that the last record it was a bit more tight you know uh with dream theater in particular uh i'll use petrucci's guitar rig as an example petrucci is iconically like uh like he has a recipe for his sound you know he's consistently using the same 412s he's got his signature boogie head he's got his majesty guitars uh he has this sense of consistency to how to achieve his sound. Whereas me on the receiving end of that, and I mentioned this earlier, I get a bit bored. Like I don't want to just look at a recall from the last record and dial it up the same way. You know, so every, every record I've done with him, I've done a different set of microphones and a, a different way to get the sound. There's things, again, this is like the trial and error thing. There's, things that I have found that work really well and I won't you know like that that becomes like a yes I'm using that that's that's the one I know that is exactly what I was chasing that's 
going to be in the recipe, but now let's do something a little different because last time we used whatever dynamic mic and it was cool, but maybe this would be better. And I go through those motions and, and kind of see if I could beat myself, you know, from a production standpoint, I always want to be more inspired than the last record. And I can't remember this, but someone had asked me at a time, you know, what's, what's your favorite record. And usually it's whatever record I'm currently working on. Cause I'm two feet in, I'm excited about, you know, what we have dialed in and, and where it's headed and where it's going. And, uh, you know, carrying that carrying the effectiveness of of what we're chasing you know with with pride and i listen to files on my dropbox more than i listen to streaming music you know it's always yeah. usually the project i'm involved with that gets me very very amped up and i want to listen to you know a hundred times yeah so let me ask you this is it ever the case that the material itself maybe because it carries some narrative sense or some thematic sense or just a vibe that is more aggressive or more introspective does any of that inform some of the the mixing or even hardware choices you make or is that too existential a question uh so are you saying is it does 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 the genre or like the, the style of music determine what you might reach for like well, for or both or even, I mean, I, I hate to only talk about Dream Theater because I, I don't want anybody to come away with the suggestion that that is the all of you as a, as a professional. But if we were to use them as an example, while it's all Dream Theater and it, it, you would never be disabused of knowing that it was a Dream Theater album, they did, they did The Astonishing, which was concept. They've done um, um, other records that have a little bit a, a, a different vibe lyrically or yeah or emotionally and i'm just wondering if when you start to hear the material even in an early form if that gives you signals on the kinds of things you might try in terms of hardware or mixing or if that if i'm getting too esoteric no i mean i'm i'm, I'm following i mean i think you can for me i could i could step away and maybe maybe say you know it unless the album was going to be really left field you know it's usually more it's usually more based on like the the broader spectrum of you know if you take something like a classical uh like a a classical recording something orchestral or things like that a lot of people have the tendency to reach for gear that uh sells itself as pristine and clean and and you know won't won't alter or color the sound of the the instrumentation then you can get a little bit more into like you know a rock scene and and or a pop scene or whatever, you know, just something where there's a little bit more vibe or mojo Then you're getting into, you know, hardware or, or plugins or production approaches that are a bit more dirty or a bit more, you know, just, just there's more coloration involved. You know, majority of the dream theater records and majority of the records I do, I'm, I'm usually using uh, Neve gear, whether that's original Neve gear or Rupert Neve designs or APIs or things that kind of, give this sense of gush into the sound where if you hit it hard it only gets cooler you know yeah. um but if i were to sit down and 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 work with some sort of orchestra or or you know a string quartet i might not be doing that i might be a little bit more like let's just take the picture for what it is and see how it fits into the puzzle later uh versus you know recording with parallel distortions and you know compressing it to death and and whatever we, yeah. they all kind of have their homes um i wouldn't say going off what you were saying with the dream theater stuff i wouldn't say there's ever been a time in dream theater's catalog where i thought to myself man that should have been recorded totally differently or that doesn't fit into what they are in the bigger picture of a band they still fit into that you know metal rock band Sure. You can record with some attitude type of vibe. Um, and I think a lot of a lot of my recording experience and my mixing experience will more or less pull from pull from that ideology of of can there be attitude or should it be clean? yeah well i was I was looking at some of the um some of what I could find of discography on you. I, I feel like I saw some stuff where you've like recorded sax players. Did I see that right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, 
I really didn't, I haven't done a great job through throughout my life of like notating everything <laughs> I worked on and not everything I've worked on has gone out to release credits. You know, there's some, you know, they, especially when I was working as a house engineer, it's like, it could be local Bob coming in to just like record something, but that's a, you know, that was a day or two days of my life where I spent, you know, recording who knows what banjo, piano, you know, so I've dealt with, I've dealt with pretty much everything that could, you could think that could come through the door for a recording session. Yeah. Um, some more unfamiliar than others, but I did a lot of saxophone recording with Richie Kanata when I was working there. Cause he is, he was Billy Joel's original sax player. He plays yeah. with uh, the Lords. They do like all the original Billy Joel music. Um, uh, I've worked with, uh, I did a live thing, like a lot, like it was recorded live and then mixed elsewhere uh, for uh, Donnie McCaslin. He's a saxophone player. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I have dealt with saxophones. <laughs> well, I, and I, I, only, I was only using that as an example uh, to be suggestive of, of, you know, other music that, that, you know, you have experience doing. Um, I guess not so far, a, a, maybe so far a field of your Dream Theater experience. I saw uh, a note that you had worked on a reissue of A Farewell to Kings from Rush. I did. I actually did. Um, I, uh, I engineered the Xanadu cover for Dream Theater that we did on the road, like between gigs. So that was a, that was a big undertaking. That was probably one of the first sessions or projects I took the lead on for Dream Theater. Uh, I kind of had to like, we, we travel with a record rig. We multi-track every show. Um, and we were on tour and I had to, you know, build a recording session, you know, click, meter map, the whole thing. I remember uh, they were really passionate about not changing the ebb and flow of of the song they didn't just want to pick a tempo and and do it they wanted it to be true so i had taken the original studio recording and tabbed to transient and created the exact tempo map because they probably weren't recording to click and created a tempo map that you know went from 110 to 108 to 106.3 back up and the whole thing to create a click track that I could not only work against and visually see what's going on, but they could listen to and, and play against. Uh, so I had done all the engineering for that um, between gigs, you know, like at sound checks and stuff. And then I sent that off to Rich Chicky to mix. That's cool. Yeah, that's cool. I mean, and I, I'm not trying to single out just the progressive stuff, but it's hard not to, it's hard to ignore a, a rush credit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's, <laughs> That that was a pretty big one, and I received the. Uh, they sent me the uh, like the deluxe vinyl. Oh, nice! Uh, you know, whenever the release came out, and that was kind of a. You had to take that moment in and go, "Wow, Russia's camp." Whether they they don't know my name, you know, but I am I am a small credit on that, and they and I have received something from the organization. So you don't necessarily think that's going to happen, and until it happens. Yeah. No, it's. Um... Um, I, you know, I always say this to artists that, uh, you know, and, and professionals, it's, um, it's an honor that you do it and, and all of that and, and humility is, is right. But you also get tabbed, tapped to do that stuff because of the work you've done. So, you know, you've earned the, you've earned the opportunity to, to do the work you've done that, you know, so many of us get to enjoy. Um, I think it's, sure. I think that's a very defensible uh, statement to make. Um, I was going to ask you this, you know, there's a lot of the fans of so much of the music that you're now associated with, um, you know, they love it for many reasons, not the least of which is its technical complexity. Um, it, does any of this, uh, has it ever presented like places where you, uh, particular challenges or um, new things you've had to sort of problem solve in order to capture it the way you wanted to? Yeah, yeah, I, I definitely say so. I mean, if we're, yeah, I mean, speaking in terms of, you know, technical music and, and, you know, prog or whatever it is, and there's, there's, was a big learning curve in kind of understanding how to make a modern sounding record 
how to make a record sound modern without taking out the human element but there is you know so you kind of have to learn how to reserve yourself because there you can get carried away and people do have the ability to chop everything up and put everything on a grid um so i mean as far as dealing with technical music i've definitely found a place where i i i know what i'm looking for and what i'm listening for in a performance that i i know will translate so it sounds modern and competitive and and larger than life and you know perfect in a lot of ways but sometimes perfect comes in the form of imperfection and and you have to know to listen for that stuff and what keeps a, a record sounding real um I think I I'm think I'm gauging kind of where your question's going. I'm not sure if I'm nailing no, what you're asking. That's you've actually answered a more interesting question um with what you I I my my question was I think even a little more basic. Um in that I um and I don't mean this to sound uh to throw shade on on other styles of music because I think there's complexity whether there's lots of notes or lots of time changes and and that sort of thing. But I guess I was wondering if on the engineering side, if, you know, with a, a, a band of musicians like you've got with Dream Theater, where everybody's so consummate at their instrument and there is sometimes so much musical information being, you know, being given, if that if that creates a kind of engineering challenge that maybe doesn't oh, okay. exist for, you Yeah, know. yeah, so absolutely. Um, I would say that the biggest thing, so even though I'm, I, I just explained that not everything needs to be to the grid and you need a, you know, there's no human flow to it. This might sound like I'm contradicting myself, but I live, you know, in the grid when I'm working with a band like Dream Theater, especially during writing, you know, like when, when they're writing a record or we're recording, my only means of fully understanding and communicating to them is making sure that when they're referencing a part i have it you know markered metered can understand the structure and the arrangement of where they're going with something so that we can communicate and i don't want to hold up their process and i also don't want to be held up either by them explaining something that doesn't land with me you know like take a rudez or or anyone who's like super heady music theory like i get that stuff and i'm into it but i'm not you know like i'm not the guy to pick out the, you know the scale or the key by just by listening and and oh you know that part where we're playing in Phrygia and I say no are you talking about the last four bars before you know chorus two because I could jump there you know and like so I'm very ahead of it or I, I aim to be very ahead of marking things out making sure that I can move pieces around and locate stuff very fast in a session um giving stuff names before they've even named it, whether that's Dream Theater or anyone, but just knowing that in my head, you know, if this part just randomly made me think of yellow, you know, for whatever reason, I'll just label it that. And that yeah. might become the bridge, but at least when they go, hey, what was that thing we did earlier? I can jump back to it. I could fly it in. I could set it in. I can communicate as to maybe why it's not going to work from where it's coming from and where it's going to, because I can see it. Um, and that helps expedite a session is just making sure you find ways of knowing how to communicate and and making sure it makes sense to you, even if you're not operating in the same exact headspace, the way they think about or a musician uh, may think about a certain section, I may think about it the, a different way or it might just connect to me differently. Um, yeah. But we can get to where we're going because I've taken all the the measures i need to make sure that we can play ball you know like when they bring something up i know exactly where we're at or vice versa i can communicate something and they know what i'm talking about are you a are you a pro tools guy yeah yeah big time yeah is that uh is that a like a soul thing and you 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 try and get all of your projects on that or is it just default there because that's what most people use i started there you know i and and through that just became very comfortable. I don't knock any other programs or or think any one is really any better or worse. I just think I know it so well and I know the capabilities it has. Um, 
that it just doesn't make sense for me to 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 go elsewhere. Maybe it's not the strongest program for just the songwriter because there's too many engineering obstacles to get over. It's not like it's it's not like an Ableton Live or something where you you see a lot of people producing on it, but I probably wouldn't feel super comfortable, at least right now, producing on something like Ableton Live because I just spend every day in Pro Tools and I could do what whatever this person's doing in Ableton Live, but I just do it differently or I get there differently. Um, but when I was like 13 years old, like that's what I saved up for. I bought my first Pro Tools rig and I've run into, especially when I was in my interning stage, I remember older engineers being like, oh, you wouldn't remember this version of Pro Tools. And it's like, well, actually I do. Like, I didn't know what I was doing, but I did own it. I did get into it and, and have a little inbox too, or whatever, you know. <laughs> what, so, what version did you start on? Uh, Pro Tools, it was like a very late Pro Tools 6, and then it was like it bumped right up to 7 type of deal. So I would say Pro Tools 7 was my first. Yeah. Yeah, I um, I didn't, I didn't know. I'm not uh, nearly at your level, but when I decided to to get something, I got Pro Tools, mostly because I, I my understanding was most studios know how to use it, and I just thought, well, yeah, make it easy. Yeah, and it it maintained for a long time. It maintained the idea of treat it like a tape machine. You know, like there was no offline print for a long time. Cause it was like, you're supposed to be coming back on a console, you know, Yeah. there's no, and there's no offline printing or, you know, uh, uh, real time uh, or not real time renders when you're going through analog gear, you know, if you want it to go through that gear, you have to run it in real time. Uh, and pro tools held on to that for a long time. Obviously doesn't necessarily make sense to limit that functionality. And they've, they've caught up to that and, you know, you could, if you're mixing in the box and you want to print offline, go for it. But if you're printing through gear and things like that, you know, Pro Tools, I always felt integrated with consoles the most intuitively and, and with outboard and things like that. Yeah. Um, so kind of backtracking on where I, another place I was heading with a, a prior question. Um, give us, give us, if you can, some some records you've worked on that would be very different from Dream Theater that maybe you're particularly proud of or that, you know, we could go check out on Spotify. Sure. Um, let's think here. Loaded question. But, uh, I mean, some of the stuff I'll probably recommend isn't, it's not like it's, it won't have a guitar, you know, things sure. like that. But there's some records I've done for, some lo I'll, I'll give some local buddies some some yeah. love yeah there's sure. there's a band called it came from space they're an instrumental band they're really cool really cool really like i don't want to say psychedelic but they're out there you know they'll they'll create like soundscapes of just like noise for a bit the drummer is unbelievable uh i mean they're all great musicians but they get a bit soundscapey and and it's it like plays into the idea of lo-fi, but we always do it with intention where it is a hi-fi sounding record, but like the elements of it that are of lo-fi were intentional. So they're always a ton of fun in the studio. Uh, there's another local artist I worked with for a long time called Little Alien. He's unbelievable. He's a one, one dude machine and just writes some of the best music I've, I've ever gotten to work on. Um, He's like a little bit more math rock-esque, like clean guitars and like a lot of tapping, but like he could do these amazing tapping or guitar arrangements and sing at the same time and just doesn't make sense, but he's great. Um, I'm trying to think of maybe some outside stuff. I can always look at my Dropbox and figure out what I've done. <laughs> uh, and what's out actually and not just something I've recently worked on. Uh great band they have an ep out uh 5800 they're actually uh the drummer is nick collins uh phil collins son oh wow they have a great ep out that i mixed a buddy of mine eric disrude he's uh drink theater's drum tech he connected me and uh i mixed that ep and kind of give some uh production input uh but totally off the the out of that scene 
uh, recently released is live sessions from an artist named Jake Wesley Rogers. Uh, he's like incredibly artsy pop, you know, like really beautiful arrangements. Uh, he released something called the Dove Sessions, which was uh, kind of stripped down versions of, of records, uh, you know, singles he put out, but he did some really cool arrangements with a buddy of mine, Aaron Kanata. They had me mix it um, with, you know, like live piano stuff and mixed with like sub synth stuff. His performances are killer. The mixes are something I'm really proud of. They feel huge, even with the fact that it was a minimal production, you know, less elements than the record. I feel like they they sound huge just because the performances and the sounds chosen to get there are, are so cool and unique. So that's some stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I was hoping to hear some um, some other things that, that myself and folks who follow the channel can go check out that you worked on. So that's great. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's funny. It's like, that's a very hard question for me because I've probably got a laundry list more, but it's just, you know, yeah. I almost get like a bit, you know, like scatterbrain when asked the question, because I'm trying to remember what I worked on recently and I've forgotten what I've worked on a month ago already. Well, one of the things we like to do is point people. If we wanted to point somebody to, is there is there a good place for us to kind of look at at work that you've done, um, whether it's a website or anything like that? Honestly, the, I don't keep up with that stuff, but I always share my work as it's coming out on like Instagram. You know, okay. I'll, I'll I'll just mention projects I'm doing on my Instagram. Okay, we'll so we'll put some links up. Uh, to that stuff so people can start to get familiar with some of the other things you do cool um, yeah and i mean on a day to day you'll just see pictures of me geeking out about gear i'm using or pictures of my dogs and my daughter <laughs> so <laughs> that's yeah if you're not into that it's all good <laughs> oh no, man that's that's that, that's part of the experience that's part of the experience i want to um i have a couple of selfish questions um and we can maybe do some of this after the stream but um the I'm a vocalist, and so I'm I have a particular interest in uh, gear and approach that you use with James, who who I've had on the show and is is a friend of mine. In fact, he sang on my record. Um, cool. He's and I, I've been a fan of his as a vocalist for so long, and I know that there's there's fans who follow the channel. I was wondering yep. if um, you talked a little bit about Petru Petrucci's setup. I was wondering if you could talk to us a little bit about James' setup. Sure. Like in the studio? Yeah. I, I mean, is, is his also an approach where you're looking from record to record to, to make microphone changes and preamp changes, you know, to, to modify or to reach for something more? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, with anything, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm that. all for that. Um, with James on this last record, he did it in New York, which hasn't been necessarily the way they've done the last few records he was recording up in Canada and there'd be remote communication but he came down I lined up four or five micro microphones in the live room um his whole bit like some vocalists I'll I like to work right in the control room with uh stick the mic you know just in a comfy place in the control room we were all on headphones I'll put a microphone in like a a reflection filter, which is essentially, uh, it's like a mini ISO booth, like it's a mobile ISO booth, you know, so it's got a mount for the microphone and then the reflection filter goes on a stand to get it to height and it kills off all reflections so that some of those things I was talking about before, like mid-range uh, mid uh, slapbacks and stuff from sheetrock, it removes the room from picking up into the microphone, which gives you a really clean professional sound. Um, I've seen those. They're like, they look, they're like semicircular. Yeah. Right? And yeah, they exactly. Yeah. They're yeah. And SC electronics makes, uh, the space reflection filter that I use and it is great. It's, it's made work so much faster. If I can keep someone in the room to do an overdub, like an acoustic guitar or a vocalist, and you can have that direct communication and you're just in the room together. It's, it's a good, it's a good vibe. Um, but with James, we set him up in the live room and we built kind of like a like a mega booth you know we put up a bunch of uh 
di- room dividers and put blankets and everything around him to give him a, a really dead space. But he was doing long days, so having the space to himself that he can move around and, and keep up with his warm-ups, and he keeps himself active throughout the day so that he doesn't, you know, kind of plateau or, or feel like he needs to rewarm himself up. So if we, we take five, I can hear him kind of like going through the motions of keeping himself warm, whether that's physical exercise or just singing, you know? So he was in that space. The first day we set up a bunch of microphones, um, stuff that he likes, stuff that I like. And we came to a, a mutual agreement about which one was our favorite. There's actually two and we left both open at all times and and sometimes we would kind of switch between what we were doing background vocals on versus lead vocals um and for the project we have great gear here but like very very great tracking preamps for uh for vocals but a buddy of mine uh mayor applebaum he did a uh, he did a preamp. He's done a couple pieces of gear, but he had done a preamp with Hendy amps, and it was called the Oven, and it had some really cool things about it that I liked, uh, like a built-in opto compressor uh, and like really wide band EQ type of thing, um, and like some top end presence versus top end, you know, like like a presence versus treble almost, you know, so like different ways to kind of get the high end out of the vocal and keep it warm sounding. But the thing that drew me to it the most was that it had this whole saturation section where you can add in a bit of distortion and you could do it in, uh, you could do it in a way where it's like a wet dry, like you can mix it in. And for a lead vocal, I didn't want to capture it distorted where you're stuck with it, but typically in a mix situation, especially on a rock record, I'm always reaching for some sort of parallel distortion or, or breakup to like mix in and allow it to compete against the wall of sound of the band. Yeah. So he sent it to me for the project and I tracked James through that. And the distortion was, if I told you it wasn't there, you wouldn't have guessed it, but it was just something about like what it added to the weight of his voice had a really nice resonance to it. But there were really no other tricks. It was just good mic into good preamp. I always track with a bit of compression. Um, he's pretty sensitive to it. So I had to kind of find a place where it wasn't crushing him, but it was still kind of doing something. Um, sometimes I like compression, not just for the idea or the purpose of compression, but just for the flavor it adds. You know, there's usually some sort of saturation or coloration going through a compressor will give you. So even if it's not moving the needle, it's still doing something. Uh, That into the rig and load up a bunch of tracks because he likes to layer, you know, so. And we have a very similar mindset about how we would approach vocals. He, you know, assessing when it's a single voice versus a double versus a triple, you know, you could... Most vocals or productions I do that the chorus will be uh, tripled where like there's a lead vocal up the center and then duplicates of it or other performances singing unison to the lead hard left, hard right. And then that gives you a landscape to build in between the lead vocal and the, the supports to put harmonies and typically a harmony all double so that can exist in between them. And then if you do in like a three part, then you kind of, you know, start to make it where one harmony harmony favors in a little bit, one out a little bit, but it gives you that big wall of sound and everything supported. And arguably the, the vocal sounds more in tune when you're giving this little sense of chorusing or modulation by having wide vocals. Um, that doesn't work in every production or every song or every moment of that song, but I would say nine times out of 10, if you have a big, big chorus with a bunch of elements going and it's hitting hard, that's a great way to get it to, to pop forward as a vocalist and make sure that you're supported. Yeah, no, that's, it's, I mean, this, this is particularly fascinating to me um, just because uh, um, I'm a vocalist and I know that there's some people who follow the channel. So I appreciate you going into detail there. Sure. Yeah. Um, 
the I'm not a drummer, and I'll I have to admit that my my most painful scars as a musician are related to drummers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I don't know why that seems to hold true with most of my my music friends, but um, I've seen I've, I've talked to Mike uh, Mangini. We had him on the show, and he's he's described how he he has built this kit that's that's sort of mirrored so he can do things and use hands without having to cross. Is 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 it just a, a matter? I mean, it seems to me that you've got so much then drum information going on that that was kind of where my head was about. Does this create sort of a logistical problem in miking, or is the number of drums really not consequential in how you think about how you would mic such such a extensive system uh, drum set? Uh, I mean, it's definitely a factor, and you start to get a little bit more into relying more on spot mics than than ambient mics and things like that i i typically like to get the the drums sounding like if i on a tracking session i like to i'll get like a kick and snare vibe going but i rely a lot on overheads and room mics and other ambient mics that exist around the kit because it not only gives you a sense of dimension of of maybe where things exist and and like you're in the room with a drummer uh but it also uh it also kind of exposes you know what's really happening it with the kit you know and like what's working in in harmony and maybe what's not if something's out of tune if something's booing in the room when it's all a close mic you can eq it all out so it kind of forces you to really go okay are these drums working in this room and then you could use, you know, different sets of ambient mics to do different things, uh, like over compress them for bigger room sound or, you know, keep a keep a microphone like right in front of the, the bass drum and, and uh, low pass that and just get a bunch of sub information off of it. And that gives like a really cool layer. Uh, the bigger the kit, and especially with someone like uh, Mangini, who's very particular about what he's doing when everything's very thought out and purposeful he is someone that you have to treat you know splash number three equally as important as snare in my head that's not something i necessarily align with you know like when i first look at a drum set i'm thinking kick snare uh and then overheads and rooms and things like that and we can get a rocking sound and then you know fill in the holes as needed but Typically, in any modern production, you're close micing everything anyway. Uh, it's just a matter of how much you're going to rely on them. So, with Mike's larger kit setups, there's a lot of channels. There's a lot of finding that balance between getting each spot mic worked in and audible, but also still making the kit feel like one whole piece. Because ultimately, to me, that's what it is. It's one instrument. It's not... It's not, again, it's not splash, splash symbol number three player. There's no like specific guy who's just been hired to hit the splash. Like it's all one space. It's all one, one instrument that you want it to feel glued and together. So it's a challenge in the sense that whatever you've worked out with the hi-hat or the China symbol, now you have to repeat that process X amount more times to account for everything he's got. Um, but it's not impossible, you know, it's yeah. just takes a little more time. No, you've done a really good job there. Um, the last several albums, I think the, the, the drum engineering has been particularly strong. Um, well, I would say, I would also, I want to give credit to Mangini. He's, he's very educated on his drums, you yeah. know, like he's, I've worked with a lot of drummers and, and some of them, we are fighting for hours trying to tune the drum, you know, because ultimately there is no, there is no good drum sound on the control room end if the drums don't sound good in the room. I mean, yeah. unless you want to cut corners and, and just go, great, I'll fix it in the mix and replace everything with a sample or over EQ to take out resonant frequencies. There's nothing better than just being able to open a channel and it sounds right. And that starts with, the player and the, the the tuning of the kit or the instrument and mike is really really on top of that stuff and he's really into understanding 
what I'm doing, you know, he'll ask questions and, and that helps, that helps him like maybe come on this end of things, come, come into the control room, listen and go, Oh, that's not exactly what I was expecting. And we can find a sound that I think is rocking for the record, but also compromises to meet what his expectation was. Um, yeah. But there's no real trickery outside of that. But it's totally a team effort when you get a drum sound. You know, it's got to be a good drummer. It's got to be a good sounding kit. They got to know how to hit, you know. Yeah. You could take the same 4-4 four, four beat, most simple thing in the world, and you'll be able to identify who's actually a drummer and who's not. Yeah. I, you know? I 100% agree with that. Um, I, I, did want, I don't want to have to have you go through this same process for every player. But I did, uh, I did want to tell you that I've also... Um, I've really loved how you have mixed in um, John Mayung in the last uh, few records. Um, I I felt like the the bass has more presence or personality. Um, and and again, I know this is all teamwork. This isn't this isn't sure. you. Like you're working with great players who have clear vision and and amazing skills. Um, but I'm 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 just trying to reference. I think that that I uh, and I and I think the fact that um, they've kind of instantiated you, uh, you know, entrusted you with their sound this way corroborates what I'm saying. But I, um, I think that the, the work you're doing on these records, which matter to so many people. Uh, and by the way, a lot of these fans are, they are musicians. They have very, they have lots of opinions <laughs> about, yeah, yeah, the, yeah, about yeah. the music. So it's, um, I think you're, you're think you're doing a really good job is oh, basically where, what I wanted to come to. Um, and I don't, I think that that's, that's a nested statement um, because because of the all of the things that I've been trying to tease out in this conversation that you that the music does and it's not just Dream Theater, um, but it, Dream Theater does present I think certain you know challenges. Sure, sure, right? absolutely. Yeah. Um, so here's a question where I, I want to let you go to be with your family, but I just one or two more questions. Is there and I ask this of everybody I talk to, but um, you know, you've got this this work that you do with the with Dream Theater and um, with other these other projects. But is there some kind of endeavor that you you is maybe on the back burner that, when time permits, you want to do? Whether it's your own music or it's you know building a boat. Like I'm, I'm just I love to hear some color from from other mountains that people oh, I talk cool. to want to climb. You know what I mean? That's cool. Yeah. Um, I. I wouldn't say anything like uh, so tangible where I can, you know, say it's specifically this. I think it would be nice to be in a position at some point sooner than later to, to actually allow my brain to turn off for a bit and maybe just, you know, hang around with a smoker and make food. It's, <laughs> it's, you know, I know it's a, it's a good problem to have to be, to be busy, but it's also a challenge to keep yourself from, from getting burnt, you know, and, and maintaining that sense of uh, mental health or just, you know, you, you want to feel good every day you go into work. And, and sometimes that stuff is, is a bit of an oversight when you're really caught up in it. Um, and not, not airing that I'm like, I'm, that's a battle I, I have. I just know it can get to that point. So yeah. I've been busy. I, I see that I'm busy for a bit longer. So you know what? If I would say what I'm most looking forward to outside of making records and, and just endeavors outside of this, I look forward to, you know, the holidays and doing some, you, you know, smoking some some meats or whatever and just hanging out and, and, and letting loose and then coming back fully recharged. Um, yeah, you know, I, I, I'm like, a, I'm a new dad. My daughter's like, five months turning oh, six months wow congratulations yeah yes yeah. so there's actually uh i'll do a tangent from a minute this is like my hail mary story uh yeah. with, with the birth of my daughter uh we started the dream theater record last october and we powered through and my daughter and i had told them early on like that my wife was pregnant and her due date was April, uh, like second week of April, April 7th, I think. Uh, so it was like on the agenda that at a certain point we needed to have a cutoff. I couldn't, you know, be working in April. My, my intention was 
March 31st would be, or yeah, end of March. Are there 31 days in March? I'm blanking. Yes. 30 yeah, March 31st would be my last day. Um, and then I would, you know, lay low. But, but that means uh, delivery to mix and the, and the whole deal. And there's a lot of components and, and things that can go wrong with that. And the biggest challenge was Labrie was coming here to do vocals from Canada. So there were some extra obstacles in place to get him into the country and working with the pandemic. Uh, so he quarantined before coming into the studio, got his results, you know, went and got PCR tests. He was all good. And then we just hit it hard straight through um, to get the record done. And he was supposed to fly out like that Monday or something, you know, like very late March, either the 30th or, or 29th or something. Um, and we were working on the last song. It's like March 25th, we started the last song for the record. Uh, and then Friday the 26th, we came in to continue working on it. And for some reason, I was just like, we're finishing today. We're finishing today. I just kept putting that out there. Just like, I, and I remember Petrucci going, is there something you're not telling me? I'm like, no, it's, it's really nothing. I just, I just feel like we should finish today. I feel like we could just push it hard. And we'll finish and it'll be great. Um, and try to manifest that idea. Yeah. For no particular reason other than just a feeling that my daughter was going to come early. Uh, and we worked the whole 26th, that, that Friday. And we finished tracking vocals on the later side. You know, we typically worked until about 11. Wrapped up. And the way that the day would go is, you know, after a full day of tracking, whatever you're tracking you're left with a lot of stuff in the session to kind of just tighten up and, and we comp this, but we didn't quite finish this. And this double is like, still needs to be looked at because we changed the lead vocal and get a reference mix going and whatever it is, you know, the whole cleanup to make the, the session presentable to the musicians uh, so they can, you know, they don't want to hear the clicks and pops of the, the not having crossfades, you know, it's all got to be there and listen back as if it was the record. Right. Um, so I remember saying to, to Maddie, because he was here for the record process, he's like, oh, when, you're getting at, when are you getting out of here? I was like, um, when the record's done. Like, he finished tracking vocals. I'm finishing everything tonight. I'm doing all my odds and ends. And I stayed in the, at the studio until about 4 or 5 a.m. or something. Wow. Um, after the full day of tracking, you know, we started 10 a.m. the day prior. So it's Saturday morning finish everything I wanted to do, you know, got, got a vocal mix going, get some, you know, automation running, things like that. Sent off the reference mix at like four or five in the morning, went home and at 7 a.m. was taking my wife to the hospital so she could get uh, like an emergency sonogram. And then I couldn't go in unless she was being admitted, but we packed bags just in case it all was happening. And she texted me and she goes, we're not going home bringing the bags wow and almost <laughs> almost exactly in in line with that i get a text from petrucci going loved it it's perfect oh so wow man it was all it was all the hail mary it was all coming down to that like that moment if i couldn't make it in i was like who's gonna boot up the rig who's gonna you know like we don't have an assistant engineer on that record it was just me so it's like labrie doesn't have all the time in the world to stay here in new york he's got to go home so yeah. how is it like stressing over this record and it just had this weird feeling and it, uh, it all came together. So it was, uh, it was a wild one. Yeah. Dude, that's an amazing story. Yeah. 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 Was, Intuition was telling you to get something done. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Totally. Uh, I, I tell cool. my wife, it was my motherly instincts. <laughs> um, but before that tangent, I was answering something. I can't remember. Um, Stuff I want to do. Oh, right? yeah. 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 So, so of... yeah. So, I'm a new dad, and um, it's given me some perspective because, like, my mentality has always been I'll, I'll go into the studio at 8 a.m. and I'll go home at 8 a.m. the next day. You know, like, if we're just going for it, like, I've that I love that stuff. That's part of why 
I do what I do. It hurts, you know, it hurts the next day for sure. And as I've gotten older, it, it hurts a bit more. <laughs> and as you know, my personal life has gotten, you know, I have more obligation. That's not something I sell as much. Like in my younger days, if there was a session, you know, like a session at Cove city that ran until 10 PM and another one starting at 11, but I could squeeze in some band I wanted to work with overnight. I would do it. I've, you know, it's, yeah. I've done 36 hour sessions. I've been up for 70 hours with micro naps, you know, doing mixes and stuff. Um, and it's fun. There's always a sense of excitement around it. It's like, to me, it's like you, you get the job done It's part of the industry, the, the music industry is a bit unhinged in that way. And that's something that I think drew me in or, or why I stayed. Um, but married with a daughter now, sometimes yeah. it's, it's nice to, to just, Take it slow for a bit. Yeah. You don't want everybody knowing, oh, well, we can totally get him to go 70 hours. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, back in the early days, it was like, that was a pitch just to get me in the room, you know? Now yeah. it's like, yeah, I could do it, but uh, there might be a little bit more of a premium premium on this one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's see. Let's manage our time so maybe we don't have to do that. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. That's cool, man. Well, hey, you've been real generous with your time. It's um, it's a delight for me to get to talk to you uh, because I love so much of what you've helped to produce. But I, I wanted to try and flesh out uh, Jimmy a little bit so that uh, people cool. who may only know you for Dream Theater learn a little bit more about you. Thanks for the, the, the leads on some of the other stuff. We'll hopefully increase your Instagram so that yeah, we'll and no sweat. I'm not looking. No, yeah, I know. I'm not, I'm not chasing followers by any no, means. No, I but. I know, but I think one of the things is you you start to find. This is how I feel, and this reason I I have these conversations is I don't consider myself a journalist uh, or a talk show host. I I, I do this because it, the music actually really matters to me, and I feel like people who are doing excellent things inside the the industry, anything we can do to sort of in, enlarge who they are is the right thing to do. Uh, and and I, so I, I only reach out to people I want to talk to. I mean, I, I get to editorialize that. So cool. it's why cool. I, cold, I cold called you with an email. Well, it's awesome, man. I appreciate you uh, hearing me geek out for the last, you know, hour and <laughs> hour and a half or so, you know? Yeah. No, I do. I, I really appreciate it. Um, uh, so thank you for all your time. Um, Absolutely. And all the, the great music that you helped to produce for us and so many fans. Um, if you'll do me a favor, just stick on the line so I can say a personal goodbye and then we'll Absolutely. our streamers go. Cool. All, all right. right. Thanks, man.